Well, I'm very delighted to be in Oxford. I haven't been here for a while, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And I'm even more delighted to speak about Wittgenstein in physics, because it has indeed been a long time coming focus on this topic. I've written elsewhere about similarities between Einstein and Wittgenstein. Today I would like to see if I can tease out a few differences. Firstly, I will share with you significant knock loss discoveries that I've made over the past two years which reconstruct an early version of the philosophical investigations. It is a version for which Wittgenstein, the scholarly community, has been searching as the missing text promised to the Cambridge University Press in 1938, with the projected title, Philosophische Bemerkungen, and for which the translation that Rees and Wittgenstein worked on together was made. It is relevant to this conference, and it is crucially important for us, as we consider Wittgenstein as a philosopher of mathematics and physics, because this early version spans the well-known 220, which constitutes the first part of the published philosophical investigations, and the mathematical section of 221, which was later published as the foundations of mathematics. In this version, we have a seamless numbering across these texts, 192 in the first typescript and 193 to 316 in the latter. I shall call this hidden revision as it was literally partially erased and hidden within the later typescripts 239, 238, and 237. In addition, the cross-referencing of numbers which Wittgenstein promised in the Vorburg to this projected 1938 book, I've been able to reconstruct from the renumberings of the hidden revision. These focus on central contemporary issues in the philosophy of physics. Four forms of triangulation became significant. Firstly, the hidden revision provided the projected title, Philosophische Bemerkungen, rather than Philosophische Untersuchungen. And I hope you can see in this, the scratching out of Untersuchungen has occurred, and we have the B quite visible, hopefully, even in the back of the room, for which he wrote this particular version. Secondly, when reconstructed, it is shown to correlate faithfully with the Rees translation and numberings. In this particular one, I don't have a pointer, and some of you, um, I hope, will be able to see this. But we can see, you can see four. Oh dear, wait a minute. You can see four is added, six added on this particular chart. And I've gone all the way through 1 to 115, which is a Rees translation. The numbers have begun to be broken up, and the Rees translation has never been able to be matched to any text. So we have been looking for it. <coughs> These carry through right all the way through the Rees translation, and they carry through the hidden revision of the philosophical investigations. The consecutive numbering has been established across all of 220 before the cuts to 2 through 9 occur and are visible in the internal numberings as well. We can see here the erased numberings. We have 188 and 189 that appear in the penciled numberings. We also find that we have the internal numberings. This was the great coup for me because the external numberings are one story. But if you have internal numberings, it means that Wittgenstein has stayed on this revision for a very long time. He's used it for a translation which he himself has worked on with Rush Rees. That means that the 239 project is indisputably distinct with the latter dated 1944 for which the Smithies translation provides corroboration. Fourthly, the hidden revisions cross-referencing of remarks provides a very meaningful cluster of ideas which are of philosophical significance for understanding Wittgensteinian mathematics and cosmology. In addition, fragment 178E, which I've elsewhere called the cosmic fragment, after Heraclitus, and a correction of a von Richt error is used to explore these ideas. Particularly significant key concepts fall along lines of a developed action at a distance, which operates in proof, the internal following of a rule, infinite divisibility, and the implications, which I shall suggest, 
could provide insights into the working at quantum and nano levels. This is the translation, which also provides the internal renumberings. These are the cross-referencing, which go from the first part of 220 over to 221, up to the very portion of Manuscript 117, which was the mathematical section, quite clearly delineated. We've never found these numbers before. We've been looking, and now we do have the numbers. As you can see, you have division of groups in the very interesting drawings. These go back to action at a distance and divisibility. Placing of the hidden revision mathematically and cosmologically. Some of you have these, and I'm sorry there are not more. I hope it will be helpful to have it on the screen, and I think the slides will appear. We have a strong nexus of interrelated Wittgenstein texts during Turing's publications on computable numbers and Gödel's incompleteness proofs. Wittgenstein's unrelenting criticism of Cantor, Erle, and Gödel falls within a larger strategy to disarm a philosophy of mathematics which relies on completed infinite sets. Because transfinite numbers are seen to resolve the Zeno paradoxes of motion, Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics began to be seen as backward-looking particularly in the period of Turing's work on the Inschneidens problem. However, Wittgenstein offered consistent criticism and alternative approaches to paradoxes of the infinitely large and small through a consistent systems approach to space, time, and generality. The logical and mathematical material which forms the later published Philosophical Bermakungen and Philosophische Grammatik had already been written in the 1936-37 period. The big type script 213 with its correlative projects 208 to 212 had been completed by 1933, including the substance of the mathematically important short essay Un Ähnlich Möglichkeit, an ending possibility. The C-series notebooks are composed 1933 to 36 with topics of space, infinite division, intervals, mathematical aspect perception, in constructive proofs, and constructions of polygons addressed. The first half of 157A is composed in 1934, with the latter part of this in Scolden in the autumn of winter of 1937. This small pocket notebook has passages about action at a distance, and Wittgenstein stated that it is wrong to conceptualize how things work as push and pull. During the 1937-38 period, and further into the lecture series, Wittgenstein continued to think about infinity and space and time, as evidenced in the catalog entries of his Hughes Court lectures, Achilles and the Tortoise, and absolutely determinate. Manuscript 121, begun 26438, is a critique of the diagonal method as a platonizing of Cantor's transfinite numbers, with Wittgenstein in 41 verso, 12738, voicing the absurdity that one infinity could be greater than another. Furthermore, the great distinction between experiment and proof, which is so thoroughly explored in the Vienna Circle years, is firmly present in these Hewell's Court lectures, which began in Lent term 1938 and continued while he held the chair at philosophy in Cambridge until 1941. At one level, Einstein's move from his earlier empirical position to that of a realism in which, as Einstein writes on 5 January 1916, space and time thereby lose the last vestige of physical reality, has a related taxonomic differentiation to Wittgenstein's differentiation between experiment and proof. However, Wittgenstein's systemic position on not ruling out realism does not rely on it. In addition, Wittgensteinian systemic time, with an internalization of the conception of time much like an internal rule, distinguished his position from what remained for Einstein even in general relativity, an external point of view. The Second Congress of the Epistemology of the Exact Sciences, jointly sponsored by the Vienna Circle and Berlin Circle, held at Königsberg in 1930, witnessed the important papers of Gödel, Hilbert, Heiting, and Weissmann's presentation, The Nature of Mathematics, Wittgenstein's Standpoint. The latter an account which allows Wittgenstein a developing mathematics which distinguishes between a set theoretic totality and a Wittgensteinian system. A similar congress in Copenhagen in 1936 focused on causality in quantum physics. 
Wittgenstein's thinking and writing of the early 1936-38 version of the Philosophical Investigations, Manuscript 142 and his transition to 221, was influenced by concerns to counter Turing's set theoretic arguments. Indeed, the references in Manuscript 117, which von Richt had interpreted to go to 221, actually, as I have established, look back to the big type script and the Vienna Circle years with extensive handwritten remarks in the margins and on the verso pages, asking what it is to think. Could there be an artificial thinking? Can a machine think? And as a parenthetical remark, Wittgenstein's answer eschews any form of naturalism. Thus, we must reappraise naturalist interpretations of Wittgenstein, such as Searle's. These questions are intimately tied to conceptions of set theory and the actual infinite as opposed to a type of constructivist mathematics and the potential infinite, which Wittgenstein supported and for which I have argued in 12, 13, 14. With the Knocklos discovery of the hidden revision, we find another important theme which parallels the philosophy of physics. This time, using his systemic argument, to counter Einstein causality through Wittgensteinian systems. NATO 1993 suggests a Markian connection in Wittgenstein's early work of the Vienna Circle years. Thus, we perceive a pattern of holism, a feature which Einstein embraced for Mach's system and which Wittgenstein very much endorsed. There is both no preferential frame of reference in general relativity and all frames of reference are, by definition, referencing all others. As Schlick points out, if we wish to maintain the postulate of general relativity, we must refrain from describing metrical and positional relation of bodies by Euclidean methods. This does not mean that in place of Euclidean geometry, we are now to use some other definite geometry, such as that of Lobachevsky or Riemann, for the whole of space, but that all types of measure determination are to be used. In general, a different sort at every place. However, during the 1936-38 period, the way in which the holism works, whether it is envisaged as causal, as Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen held in the EPR paradox of 1935, or systemically, as Wittgenstein held, was the focus of the research community and remains an entrenched research issue in contemporary physics and cosmology. In the Hughes Court Lectures, Wittgenstein addressed the issue of causality, criticizing Russell's views, and when talking about the two seeds, as recorded by Rees and other students of these lectures, Wittgenstein brings in concepts of action at a distance, indeterminacy, and indeterminism, as that which shocked scientists revolutionized science. In the third section, I want to look at the opportunity of an ending division and the idea of infinity as a property of space. Wittgenstein was always fascinated with aspects of divisibility. Before looking closely at the cosmic fragment, I want to look at the earlier essay, Un Inlig Möglichkeit, on ending possibility. This essay successfully draws together several mathematical and physics issues. Firstly, space is characterized not as itself extended, but that der Raum gibt der Wirklichkeit eine unendliche Gelegenheit der Teilung. Space gives to reality an unending opportunity for division. Secondly, everything must already be contained in the sign 1, x, x plus 1, as the expression of the rule of composition. The unending possibility is not introduced by a mythical element in logic or grammar. And the idea of infinity as a property of space is rehearsed in one of the C-series notebooks, which you see here. 
Manuscript 149, written in 1935 to 36. And access one of the precursor drawings to the 1937 fragment drawings of construction of series, which we will look at next. Given Wittgenstein's conception of space, the conception places infinite divisibility as an internal property of space, aligned to an internal rule, not an external rule which produces predetermined outcomes in a mechanical or causally determined way. Within the 1937 drawings of the cosmic fragment, the machinist symbol of its own functioning has developed as a system which can be compared with the construction of an infinite series because the logician Zwang is now emphasized to be essentially connected with unending possibility. The inevitability of ein Zwang Luffig Führung is clearly seen as a hardness which can be confined to a poorly conceived mental mysterious mechanism or a rigid machine part in time, unlike proof which is not time bound. And relatedly, in the first section of manuscript 117, which forms part of the hidden revision, the internal properties of a series, alternative divisions of groups, mathematical aspect perception, and the Einsteinian remark, how we measure is what we measure, are present. I found this particularly interesting when I was looking at all of the Wittgenstein Knockloss materials. It, it sort of jumped up at me as something that was quite important. So I'll just give you some context of this. This particular fragment of notes is unnumbered, written quickly in a particularly loose hand, the content of which sprawls across four pages of large English diary, printed with the dates August 1937, 5 to 18. The notes in several drawings cover the pages as if the dates are not there at all. The entries, both at the beginning and the end, show that there was more text either side of the fragment, thus this has been torn away and saved. It is accepted in the literature that manuscript 142 is crucial as a source of the philosophical investigations, 1 to 189. Relatedly, these remarks are the locus of the widely conjectured connection Hacker 2005, Pikla 2004, and Schurter 2001. Therefore, with its text spanning this juncture, this fragment is positioned pivotally. The fragment's key bridging concepts of Hörte de Logician Zwang on in the Raya, Maschine Azimbo ihr Funktion, and the question, Abazin den der Übergang also dort die Algebraische Formel bestimmt, function pivotally to allow a consistent and developing mathematics for Wittgenstein. Significantly, the importance of these concepts within Wittgenstein's thought paves the way for the radical reordering of the Wissenfassung or the intermediate version of the philosophical investigations. At a deep level, what I hope will filter through in this lecture is that the philosophical investigations, when viewed through the hidden revision, has far more to say about mathematics and physics than has hitherto been thought. And cosmologically, the diary entry of 24.237 resonates with the mathematical conception of the construction of an infinite series. It is strange that one says God created the world and not God is creating continually the world. The machine as a symbol of its function is conceptually important because once the symbol can in some sense offer infinite possibility, the idea of infinite movement as symbolized also becomes infinite constructive possibility. Infinite construction symbolized as the machine, a symbol of its own function, is very like the construction of an infinite series, which are the true bridge concepts of this very important fragment. And I want to just show you this as well, and then we'll go back. These are the pages which are also included in the fragment. There are four pages. And this was written during the very end of Manuscript 142 when we formed the bridge to the philosophical investigations. So there are, there's information in this fragment which shows the final workings out of that section of the philosophical investigations. And the little insert there is one of the famous lines which follows all of the materials which then become the final version of the philosophical investigations. 
I'll leave this so we can have a look, because I think this is particularly wonderful, this one. Do you all like this one? I hope you do. <laughs> it, it's got an awful lot in it, and we'll, we'll just look more carefully at it. Next, I want to talk very briefly about uh, Aina Algamain and the geometric, a general geometry, and the internal rule and iteration and calibration, which is what I have been asked to pull my lecture around to, uh, and, and I will do so. Relatedly, we could consider the geometric construction of a triangle, which is not the construction of merely a particular triangle. This is why it does not matter to Verstehen or understanding if the triangle is not drawn imperfectly. Indeed, it is unclear what a perfectly drawn triangle would be or what its use might be. This is important and relevant today because the machine learning research in this approach, there is a recalcitrant problem with a gap between the general and the particular. Within Wittgensteinian mathematics, the construction is a general proof of triangles. As early as manuscript 108, Wittgenstein had conceptualized Agamemnon geometric with space as a possibility of movement and motion. And to bring this idea back to divisibility, we can view constructive divisibility as the possibility of application projecting, shining through space. The Anwendungsmöglichkeit Struktur die Raum. With the pivotal strength of the combined concepts of the fragment by manuscript 126, which is a very mathematical notebook, construction becomes proof of the finite of the infinite in virtue of its form. So construction becomes proof of the infinite in virtue of its form. This resonates with the early work begun in the 1929 article. And for all of my life, I've wished to speak about the 1929 article, and now it has slotted in very nicely, so I'm very pleased to be doing this. The title is Some Remarks on Logical Form. In this article, it's pointed out that two values of a continuous spectrum cannot be in the same logical space. The idea that two people cannot occupy the same chair is the homespun example of Wittgenstein's uh, essay to the theoretical physics concept that time, space, temperature, color, tone, all admit of unenlic divisibility while retaining a sense of integrity of value within the interval considerations. It is not the clear metric, the Einsteinian metric, of point coincidence. But these are precursor ideas to entanglement as an indeterminate system. This does not mean that it is merely a random walk. Within an appendix, manuscript 117, 97 to 110, which is a critique of Cantor, no agumen and begrief, or general concept, of an unending quantity or set is appealed to. In other words, there is no need for an infinitely large or small number to exist for a perfectly good conception of the infinite to be possible. These considerations show that for Wittgenstein, mathematics and use as an unending possibility of application are seamless, and that the cross-referencing of the hidden revision, action at a distance, is linked and explained through application of a rule. One to one focuses on infinity through exploration of invicklum, or development of a series as an internal rule-bound technique with this technique able to demarcate various systems of development. As Turing's position moved towards defining thinking, the thinking machine as a learning machine, Shanker points out in 1987, I suggest we're able to understand the shift to rule following in games as a mathematical response in its elucidation of the internal rule. These considerations of the internal rule are very important in considerations of iteration and calibration. So we will look at Wittgenstein's fascination with the logical properties of measurement. The interval versus the point, the heap versus the set. In the early notebooks after Wittgenstein's so-called return to philosophy, there's a pronounced interest in intervals, in many types of division, in the characterization of pi and other irrationals, as in different systems, in that they are not merely 
extensions of the rationals. Yet it is clear that the various number systems are tangentially related in this motley of mathematics, as Wittgenstein called it. The cosmic fragment is the pictorial version of this important idea. This picture is a stage further than entanglement simpliciter because there is calibration across systems rather than just calibration across particles. Now, if we look at this, I want to look at just several ways that we can construct series and that they are embedded and interpenetrate one another. Within the clustered drawing, there is the series of the natural numbers represented by the smaller circle within the larger one, two, and three, which I think is very visible. You can see the one and then two circles and three, presumably as an infinite series, or at least to be seen as part of an infinite series because we have an inlik raya just written above it. So he's looking at infinite series. The next level of reading of this diagram is more interesting. The circle with one smaller circle only, which represents one in the first series, acts pivotally to unlock other possible series. We could construct two in a variety of ways. In other series, moving from one to the left, we have a small circle inside a rectangle inside the larger circle. This is a perfectly good number two. It could also be the start of an infinite series itself with a rectangle acting as one, the small circle as two ad infinitum through infinite division. While the first series begun at our first one could continue on its path. This would represent an embedding of one series in another, according to which expectival construction we use. Another group within this drawing are the circles with squares and rectangles above the machinist a symbol ear function, if you look at those. Here we have number one represented by one large square in a circle at the apex of a triangular positioning, with number two represented by two rectangles in a circle at the left base position. And then three is represented by a square with a circle inside it, with a square inside it, or within a larger circle at the right base position. This last, more intricate representation could also be an infinite series of its own, which is embedded in the original series. There are several other paths we could construct in this analysis, or we could use modular arithmetics to increase the diversity and flexibility of these systems of numbers. As Wittgenstein states, systems are certainly not all in one space, Now my concluding remarks. There is a growing tendency, at least amongst a few people, to conceptualize the infinite as that which, with no defined least upper limit and no defined lower bound. I have been pleased to be informed of this fact by the cosmologist Arthur Gibson, as this is how I have envisaged infinity, and it is certainly in line with Wittgenstein's conceptualization. So there are a few more people, both living and dead, who join this small group. I was loath to begin my paper with such a conception, lest it be truly unruly, but I encountered exactly the same idea a week ago at a conference in Krakow at which I had been invited to speak. The context then was Wittgenstein's early, unpublished first version of his symbol for the general proposition, which you can see in the Bodleian here. This was changed by the time of publication of the Tractatus in 1921. But it is a clear record of a deep problem and a deep thought during the years of Einstein's move from special to general relativity. The problem with such a picture is that initially we appear to have just one big universe with no window into its functioning or parts, a heap from which no single atom can be selected. However, we know that Wittgenstein was comfortable with the heap. In a similar vein, he was comfortable with the path, or Einer Weg, placing emphasis on generality as a direction, on the infinite as a direction, in such a way that the refined conception 
of generality is entwined with the potential infinite and the operation rather than the function. He states, generality in mathematics is a direction, an arrow pointing along a series generated by an operation. It is possible to speak of things which lie in the direction of the arrow, but nonsense to speak of all possible positions for things lying in the direction of the arrow as equivalent for this direction itself. This moves generality firmly away from the disjunctive set interpretation which Wittgenstein had held earlier. For our purposes today, the differences between classical and quantum computing is relevant, with the classical computational program unable to create the type of memory which would allow the conception of a direction in the way in which Wittgenstein envisaged. It is interesting that Wittgenstein spoke on the topic of infinity at the meeting of the Aristotelian Society in which he planned to use some remarks on logical form. As this article sets the stage for the later entanglement ideas of the Hidden Revision, the Hewell's Court Lectures, and many of the passages within the Lachlas that we are now reading with much greater understanding. It seems we have a picture of an overlay of intervals, each with the unending possibility of division. We could almost say that counterintuitively we cannot understand directionality without indeterminacy and indeterminism. What this opens up for us is that calibration across systems, rather than a geometry of point coincidences, is a real possibility in thinking about how the universe works. Wittgenstein's system is never point-based. Rather, it is interval-based, with each interval both a system unto itself and calibrated across other systems. But since number cannot be thought of as equinumerity, according to Wittgenstein, calibration does not work Russellian style with number classes or act in any sort of bijective correspondence. Rather, the systems hook onto one another through some form of similarity or family resemblance. This really is what constructing at the nano level looks like. That the machine symbol remains within Wittgenstein's way of thinking is evidenced by remarks in Manuscript 130, May to August 1946, in which he talks of language as a machine and the proposition as a machine part. The proposition is at the level of constructed symbolic meaning and value. And I suppose if we thought of language as the universe, bounded and unbounded, iterative but creative, then a universal language machine would be just the oscillating universe's information that was proposed in the late 20th century and developed in 21st century theoretical physics and cosmology. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was hoping that you could say a little more about the relation between the notion of a rule and the notion of a machine. In fact, the notion of a rule, as you uh, said, connects to the idea of an internal relation. Yes. But to my mind, also the notion of a machine actually connects to the idea of an external. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And I think that Einstein's uh, very beautiful theory, and as I've said, I've written in other places about the similarities between Einstein and Wittgenstein and how, they, how Wittgenstein learns from Einstein, I think. But Einstein's universe still appears to be like a geometric machine. There's something that is more rigid about it. There is, of course, more determinant. But when you look at a system of entanglement which does not have predetermined uh, uh, you couldn't have a point, a point incident. It's completely in a different system. If your machine is like that, it's not the rigid machine of either special relativity, which has a kinematical base, or even as you move towards uh, general relativity, which I think is almost a geometric machine. So you've got to realize that you, you start off with a different system when you're forming your machine. So that, I don't know if that helps. I hope that does help. Any questions? Yeah. Um, could I just say that your talk has brought home to me the extent to which Einstein did think about mathematics and physics. 
But as a philosopher of physics and somebody who's spent a long time looking at Einstein's work, I'm astounded at the claim that, I, that Wittgenstein had a premonition into entanglement, indeterminism, well, long before these things were Absolutely. Started. No, this is what's so exciting about the hidden revision. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled because it shows through many different Narclos connections, we have the quotations. There's no doubt about it, and you have it in the Huel Court lectures. I, I'm a, I should probably explain that I, I never believe anything until I have hard evidence. I don't have conjectures. I, I, I'm not one of those people. I dig and dig and dig and dig, and when I get enough of my physical evidence, I then start to believe what perhaps... Uh, I wouldn't have actually thought of this before, though. Because I, I think it would be very, very helpful for people in the background of physics to see the way that you define the Okay, I, I would love to do that. To see the way, for example, I mean, of course, entanglement is perfectly consistent with determinism. There are several interpretations of quantum indeed, mechanics indeed. Which, which reconcile entanglement with determinism. Yes. And I, and I could not understand what an understanding of the metric in general relativity has to do with point coincidence. Or I think that in this particular piece, because it was a short sort of slot, I was asked to find something, either an overlay, which there was a similarity or there was a difference. And I think that when you have an interval as your main uh, base, shall we say, that's the wrong word to use, perhaps, but when you have an interval rather than a point, I think that you're in a different paradigm. And again, that's a bad word to use. So I think that you have a different metric. And that's my, my own understanding. And I, I would very much like to talk with you at, in, at more length about it, because I think it's a very exciting field now. And we're just starting to look at com common trees in a new way, a completely new way. Uh, so yes, I, I would value a conversation with you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, perhaps in, in a time I've got, I, I, I could ask a question which follows on from that. Supposing we're convinced that Wittgenstein uh, prefigured or predicted or something entanglement, mm -hmm. so what? Why, why is that exciting? I think it's exciting because we haven't really looked at him as a philosopher of physics before. I think philosophy of language, sort of for 50 years, we've had philosophy of language, which has been very good. Uh, and I've talked with some people even who are logicians and who would look at the logical properties of certain things through the eyes of a philosopher of language. But when you start to look at things as a philosopher of mathematics, you see different things. I mean, perhaps we've just got on our different glasses. But we haven't actually seen this before because we haven't found the hidden revision. That's my point, is that we now have new information to show that, indeed, a real revision was made between 142 and a mathematical section of uh, what became 221, but it was actually 117, a very well-developed argument. So there's just been a conjecture before that the two got put together for the 1938. And I'm saying that there's actually a more clearly defined revision there, which is looking much more at ideas, uh, maybe the Entscheidung problem, all of the things which are in the air at the moment, and he's responding to those in his renumbering and his cross-referencing. <coughs> Okay, good. Well, thank you very much.